All right. So thank you again, uh, Shane and everybody for joining us tonight on this webinar. I am super, super excited to present about this. And, and it, really, I, I'm entitling it Base Training and Weight Loss. Your, your base training is out, I'll get into, there are many different definitions of base training. Uh, it could be long, slow miles. It could just be, you know, adding some tempo or threshold every so often while staying aerobic. So it's all over the board. So I'm going to get a little bit into that a little bit later. Uh, weight loss, Shane wanted me to cover weight loss a little bit because as I was talking to him a little bit uh, before everyone came on, this time of the year, I have a lot of athletes approach me as a sport dietitian. They say, it's, it's time, right? I'm getting ready. I'm getting my, my butt back in the saddle again. I want to lose a little bit of weight. I want to get fitter. I want to get more healthy for the season. So this is the time that I see athletes really coming out in droves to try to associate both. Now, here's the thing. If you don't necessarily want to pursue weight loss or body composition changes, totally fine. This will still be a great, tremendously beneficial webinar for you, but I am going to put a weight loss spin on it uh, throughout just to kind of go back and forth, depending on what your needs are. So let's go ahead and delve in it. I don't think I need to talk about myself, but I am a registered dietitian. I'm here in Colorado. Uh, I am also a uh, strength and conditioning coach and endurance coach myself. You can see a couple of things I've done. I'm not going to really highlight those. You can go back and read about those later, but here's what we're going to do today. I really want to get into the really like, what is this base training, which I actually call preparatory training. So excuse me if I go back and forth, they are synonymous in my mind, but what are the base training meso cycle? So usually like two to three month cycle training cycle. What are we talking about in terms of nutrition? Like what do we need to be doing from a daily nutrition perspective and a nutrient timing perspective? So it's very important to understand that in the sport nutrition world, we do disassociate those. They do come together, but we, we kind of split them apart because in sport nutrition, we really emphasize daily nutrition and nutrient timing separately they will come together, like I said, in really daily nutrition supports nutrient timing, but you can't just say, oh, I'm in base training. What should I eat during my rides, right? It actually, you have to back it up a little bit and say, what am I putting in my body for breakfast and lunch, dinner and snacks? So we're going to, we're going to discuss that. And then we're really just going to, I think, really sprinkle this whole weight loss conundrum, this puzzle, this complex scenario of how do you actually lose weights or, and, or manipulate your body composition. And let me just talk about that really quick. I am not, and never been a huge fan of that, that demon number that you see when you step on a scale and you look down, right? It just, it really doesn't tell you a lot in terms of what is happening in your body. So for example, I've got a lot of athletes who they do weigh themselves, right? If you weigh yourself and your weight fluctuates about four to five pounds, that is purely water weights. And that's what starts to really affect, negatively affect the psyche. Because if you're stepping on the scale, like, wow, I'm, I'm up two pounds or wow, I'm down a pound, that's gonna cause these different emotions, be it positive, negative. It's really just water fluctuations, intra and extracellularly. So you can't really base weight, your, your, your body weight on a scale as whether or not you are a successful person or not, right? So let me, I just wanted to put that out. The weight does not define you as a positive or a negative person or positive or negative success in your weight loss or body comp journey. So I am much more of a fan of measuring body composition because I think that starts to tell a story. And here's the thing about body composition. You don't have to have, although it's nice, you don't have to have like the fancy, the, the gold standard in body composition measurement is what's called DEXA. It's dual energy X-ray absorbed geometry. So basically, if you've ever done this before, or if you haven't, I'm going to describe it anyway. You lay down on a bed and you you lie uh, very very still, and there's this there's this really low level uh, laser beam basically uh, that shoots just a really low level of radiation across your body. Right, it goes up and up and down. It's giving you your body composition, but more importantly, they use that to actually measure bone density. That is the gold standard. Like if you were to ask Bob, where, what should I do to get my body fat measured? That's the gold standard, right? Then we start coming down a little bit. Then we've got the hydrostatic weighing, which is done in water. We've got the bod pod, which is done through air movement, air displacement, all the way down to the pinchers, right? The skin calipers. And even what I tell a lot of my athletes is if you just have a cloth tape measure, not that it's measuring body composition, but if you measure your, your limbs, specifically probably your chest, your waist, your hips, your legs, your quads, and your calves, and maybe your arms, like your, your, your biceps, 
you can get a good idea of what's happening in terms of your muscle mass. Now you're not going to have quantitative numbers, but you can say, you know, you can measure and say, well, my waist is 34. And then three months later, well, my waist is 32. Right. So there's some different ways to actually measure body composition without stepping on that scale. But I digress. I'm not going to bad mouth the scale. I'm just going to say it doesn't tell you the whole truth a lot of the time. So with that disclaimer, I guess, out of, let's, uh, let's go here and talk about where we're kind of going to. And I, I did want to put, put this up one more time. If you listened to my last webinar, you saw this same, uh, the same uh, slide, except it was the energy systems of the body. So remember we were talking about aerobic versus anaerobic and anaerobic was on the left, which is the green now. And aerobic was the blue, which is on the right. I put this actually into what your goals are. So not really energy systems, but now we're talking about base training. What are your goals? So I kind of want to go both ways. So if you have a weight loss goal, we need to talk about metabolic efficiency training and low training zone training, right? So that's your aerobic uh, when you're in and out of the saddle. If you don't want weight loss, we're just going to teach you how to eat to train appropriately for your goals. Right, so we can kind of split this. I wanted you to keep in mind the energy system. So remember again, aerobic is, I, I talked to Shane and, and what he told me was the majority of your training is aerobic, majority. There is a minority that's done in zone three, four, five, um, and so on and so forth, but not a lot right now. So I need you to remember that as I tell you, as I go through this story tonight, right? Aerobic is predominant, anaerobic is a little bit more of a minority right now. So keep that in mind. Okay, on to the big picture. You saw this last time. I'm, it's just purely a reminder, right? Bell-shaped curve, the majority of people, the population and the athletes that I work with and teach, we want to focus on the middle here. We don't necessarily want to focus on the left, which is our low-carb, high-fat, or ketogenic diets, or the right, the high-carb, low-fat. So we kind of want to find that sweet spot, which I, of course, call metabolic efficiency training, right? So what is that? That is the combination of aerobic training. That's the exercise. That's a 25% exercise that you see at the top combined with daily and training nutrition. And that's the 75%, right? So what I'm saying, trying to describe on this slide, the majority of your success in weight loss specifically or body composition changes will be from nutrition. I'm sure that's nothing new, but every so often I do get an athlete that pops up and say, well, I'm just gonna train until I'm blue in my face and I'm gonna eat whatever I wanna eat. Well, if you're a teenager, that might work, but not when we get in our thirties, forties, fifties and beyond, right? It just doesn't work with that wonderful biology of aging, right? We also wanna consider the periodization cycle that you're in. So we already determined that base training, which I call preparatory training, right? We need to keep that in mind because you need to actually feed your body for the training cycle you're in, but then there's this little monkey wrench with weight loss and body composition changes. So just to kind of emulate here, we're going to be focusing not on the two uh, outside parts, right? Not low carb, high fat or high carb, low fat. We're gonna be focusing on metabolic efficiency training because irregardless if you wanna lose weight, this is actually how you should be eating, right? And I'm gonna show you both sides of this just in case you don't have a weight loss or body composition goal. All right, so back to the big picture of nutrition periodization. I showed this last time again. We are focusing on that kind of that teal blue, the preparatory, which you can call base. It's on the left-hand side. And as you can see, I added a little bar that's weight loss. This is actually the best time of the year to start actively losing weight or manipulating body composition. A lot of people think it's during their transition or their off-season, and that's actually fairly false depending on the athlete because during off season, you actually just, you just want to have fun. Like you don't want to really work with anything in terms of nutrition, right? Cause you're not training necessarily. So you don't really have to, or you don't really want to focus on that nutrition job, if you will. So this is the prime time, the early base kind of early to mid season base training preparatory cycle is optimal. So we are going to specifically talk about the base cycle, right? We're going to go into what we need to look at in terms of nutrition. So I am going to, like I said, I'm going to go kind of toggle back and forth between weight loss, which is synonymous in my mind with body composition changes, and then no weight loss, right? So obviously during this cycle, if you have a goal for weight loss and body composition, we are going to factor that in. And that is actually, let me just tell you this, that is your primary goal. So I work with a lot of athletes, especially this time of the year, 
and I have to kind of bargain with them a little bit. And I, I want to tell you what that means. When, when an athlete comes to me and they say, I'm in base, you know, I'm doing some, just some good volume, low zone training, maybe the occasional tempo threshold VO2 day here and there, but I want to lose weight. I ask them, what is most important? Because this is really key that you answer this question for yourself. What is most important right now for your goals? Is it weight loss, body composition, if, you're, if you have that goal, or is it just manipulate or just accumulating volume in the saddle, right? Maybe some strength training too. Obviously, I, I think I know the answer, but the reason why I ask that from for athletes, because I want you to answer that and be accountable to yourself also, right? Because if you do have a weight loss and body composition goal, we have to be all in with it. It doesn't mean you're depriving and you're eliminating and you're sacrificing things. It just means you need to be all in with that goal, okay? This is also a great time of the year. I know I mentioned it last time, but I do wanna highlight it again. Metabolic efficiency testing. If you ever have the opportunity to have a metabolically efficient test, or I'm sorry, metabolic efficiency test done, please do, please, 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 please do. Why? I'll tell you a little bit later, right? Because that can actually promote a little bit more of a successful journey in weight loss. And, and I'll show you why just by throwing a, a, little, a few numbers and some pre and post testing that I did with a female cyclist a few months ago, right? So let's just keep that in mind. If you ever have the opportunity, and you can certainly ask me questions at the end of this uh, regarding that and if it's pertinent for you. I also want to teach you how to eat to train, right? So obviously we know we're coming off the holidays. You know, a lot of people tend to go off the, the bender a little bit with the holiday eating, which is totally fine. It's part of human nature. You should actually allow that. That's, that's forming a good, good, healthy relationship with food. But eating to train simply means this. If you're training between, let's say you're, if you're training under 10 hours a week and the majority, 75, 80% of it or so, is mostly zone one, zone two, maybe a splattering of zone three training. You need to eat to support that, right? So here's what I'm saying. Your body typically, depending actually on your metabolic efficiency, which is your ab ability to utilize fat as energy, right? If your efficiency is high, you can actually go for rides of two to three hours and utilize more of your fat stores as energy and store, just kind of keep your carbohydrate stores at bay where they need to be because you're not doing a lot of intensity, right? This is what eating to train means. Some of you in, in a lot of athletes I see during this stage, they go right back into their competition psyche where they're like, if I'm on the bike for two hours, I've got to have my, my steady sugar uh, intake every 20 to 30 minutes, right? Now that may be good for competition season because you're eating for competition, but we're trying to eat for base training right now. And if you also have the weight loss goal or body comp goal, we simply may not need that specific nutrient timing strategy. So I'm kind of daunting the carrot in front of you. I'm going to get more into that as we progress in this webinar tonight. But suffice to say, eat to train. If your training is low vo volume or even in or low intensity, we need to support that, right? Uh, and I'm going to show you some different examples on how to periodize that as we go along. This is what's super, super exciting. I got really excited about this webinar. So I'm gonna show you what I do with athletes and I call it this really fancy name, microcycle periodization. That just basically means this. We're gonna take a week at a time. So seven day rotating cycle, which most coaches and most, most athletes train on, they go from Monday through Sunday, right? Or Sunday through Monday, right? What I'm gonna teach you and show you with a graphic example and representation of just a pseudo athlete, make believe athlete, is how you can actually periodize your nutrition to support either weight loss and body composition changes or simply the eating to train mantra if you have different cycling sessions throughout the week, which of course you should because we don't do the same exact thing every single day, right? So that's gonna be super exciting when we get to this slide. It's gonna, I think it's gonna help you really put everything together. So be sure you have a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil or however you take notes, if it's digitally, electronically, because you're definitely going to jot down a ton of notes when we get there in just a few minutes. Okay, before I start anything though, I do have to recognize this and I do have to teach this because I, I work with all my athletes in, in learning this specific uh, behavior change model. There's actually a model that looks at how you go through successful behavior change. So let me just back up. If you say, Bob, I want to lose weight, that's a behavior change. Bob, I want to lose body fat, that's a behavior change. Bob, I want to start training for my first century or whatever it is. 
that's a behavior change, right? It's really important to understand, especially with nutrition changes, because those are tough. It's a lot harder, in my personal and professional opinion, to manipulate nutrition than it is to manipulate your training, because training is usually one to a couple hours a day, whereas nutrition is like 24 seven, unless you're sleeping, right? So let me go back to this. When you're implementing a weight loss, nutrition shift, uh, uh, body composition plan, we need to focus on that being a behavior change and making it successful. So let me just go through the slide really, really quickly. There is this model that's called the stages of change model. It's also called the trans theoretical model. It's decades and decades and decades old. We've been using it in the nutrition and wellness field for God knows how long, right? What it basically says is if you look at the bottom of the slide, right? The bottom of the slide on the left says pre-contemplation. And then if you go right over to the right with that little person sitting on the ledge, it says, not ready yet, thinking about it, right? So there are a lot of athletes who are not even thinking about making a change yet, right? So usually those are the athletes who have no idea. Maybe they, they don't want to lose weight. They don't want to do a different behavior. Like they have no, no recollection of wanting to change anything at all. And that's fine. Totally fine. That's not a person that's actually going to say, I want to lose weight. I want to change my body fat percentage. I want to build muscle, right? It doesn't, it, it really matters what stage you come into this behavior because that is going to dictate what you should actually do and what you're able to do. So as an example, the next step up, which is called contemplation, you are contemplating making a change. So some of you listening to this might be in contemplation right now saying, I'm contemplating the idea of wanting to lose weight or manipulate my body composition in some way. And that's fantastic because now you're thinking about it. You're not quite acting on it yet, but the idea is in your head, right? It always happens after the holidays. So if you're at the next stage of where you're kind of preparing or preparing to take action, now you've gone through and you've said, I know I want to do this. I know I want to lose weight. I know I want to change my body fat percentage. Now I need to prepare. So I need these resources. I need a training program. I need to eat correctly. I need to recover correctly. I need to read. I need to research. I need just to be a sponge, right? I need a, a menu. Uh, I need a meal plan, whatever it is, right? You are preparing to take action, right? And then the next one is the action phase. That's the great one because you're actually doing it, right? You're training, you're following good nutrition plan. Everything's coming together. You may not see a lot of success initially, but everything is coming together, right? That is the taking action phase. Usually it takes about, and I'm, I'm kind of worrisome to say this, but it takes about six to 12 months to actually get to the top of a behavior change, which is what we call the maintenance phase. So you are now maintaining a positive behavior change. So six to 12 months is usually what the researchers say. I've seen that some athletes do it in a couple months. I've seen some athletes do it. It, it takes usually 18 to 24 months. It really just depends, like a lot of life situations, right? But what the goal is, is to go from the bottom to the top in behavior change because we want to get to that point where you are maintaining. So I'm hoping we can, you can get to that point before the summer season hits, right? That would be awesome, right? It's not six months, but you know, it's, it could be pretty close actually, right? So that said, I, I'm, the only reason I'm really introducing this is because a lot of athletes get down on themselves and they think they're bad people because they're not making success and they're not having a lot of great success along the way. When in fact, you probably are. It's just, we, you know, we have to kind of celebrate those small successes. Uh, I think a lot of us, because of this immediate gratification in our society, we want it now, 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 right? Well, a lot of times it could be as simple as, wow, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a belt and I put it one notch tighter, right? That's, that's great success. Like I, you can actually notice that you're taking, not only taking action, but being very successful in your behavior change. So just remember, it's, it's not like a, it's not like, like firing a gun. It's not like poof, you pull a trigger and it's gone, right? Behavior change takes weeks to months to sometimes years, and you will enter at certain stages. So don't get down upon yourself, right? There's also a thing called relapse. Relapse means you kind of, you, you've heard of, of the analogy, take two steps forward, one step back, right? That's kind of behavior change too. So you'll be successful. You'll be successful. And then, you know, maybe it's, it's a, it's a friend's birthday party or a child's birthday party or your birthday, right? And, and all of a sudden, oh, you know, I'm, I, I kind of step backwards a little bit for a day. That's no big deal, right? That's just a speed bump in, in my verbiage, right? So you will relapse, 
the goal is not to relapse more than two stages below where you're at, right? But again, we don't have to get into this. I just wanted to tell you that relapse is absolutely normal. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. And it does actually mean that you will still continue to be successful because it is a natural progression and evolution of behavior change model and behavior change theory. Okay, enough of the psychology. Let's get into this whole metabolic efficiency training. Once again, just to refresh your memory, if you didn't hear me last time, our bodies, I'm sure you know this, are just unbelievably amazing, right? Absolutely in what they do on the inside. Your body stores roughly 80,000 or more calories as fat. Now, a lot of times we don't see all of that because it's intra-abdominal, it's intramuscular, it's intra-organ, right? Sometimes you don't see it, but we have a lot of calories stored as fat. And as you can see, depending on your size and your gender, so small females store less carbohydrate, larger males store more simply because carbohydrates are stored, the majority of carbohydrates are stored in your muscle tissue. So if you're a larger person with more muscle, you will have more carbohydrate storage. So this is, I, I actually created this concept about seven, 16 or 17 years ago now. And I wanted to find, I wanted actually to answer the question, if we have so many stores of fat, and very little stores of carbohydrate, is there a way that we can actually manipulate our body to use, kind of wake up those fat stores, use them for energy? If you use them for energy, so if you think of, the, think of it this way, if you're burning more fat, I hate to say burning, but I'm gonna say burning. Uh, in, in the scientific world, we call it oxidizing or oxidation, right? So, but if you're burning fat, that means you're storing carbohydrate, which means you have carbohydrate for more high intensity efforts which is usually your zone four or five or whatever, six, depending on the zones that you use, right? Or it could be some power, some explosive interval based. So we actually want, irregardless of weight loss, you actually want to teach your body to burn more fat so you can store those carbohydrates so they're there when you need them. Instead of the opposite, because then the opposite is what, what you probably heard as bonking before. You're bonking because you're going through your carbohydrate stores so quickly because you haven't taught your body to burn the fat for energy. So that's just a little reminder. We've got a whole bunch of fat and not a lot of carbohydrates. So let's, let's, let's get into this a little bit. It, this is all about, as I teach you here tonight, this is all about how you manage and optimize your blood sugar. So why is blood sugar so important? Well, there's two things that can happen with your blood sugar. It can look like a roller coaster, as you see, right? This is the unhappy blood sugar line. Why is it unhappy? Well, let me, let me explain this, and I might explain it a couple times, but when you eat any type of food, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, there will be a rise in blood sugar. Depending on that nutrient, carb, protein, or fat, it will either go very low or very high, right? So as an example, if you eat a banana, nothing wrong with a banana, but a banana is purely carbohydrate. A purely carbohydrate rich food will actually rise your, will, will increase your, your blood sugar and what I call spike it, right? Very, very quickly, probably within the first 10 to 15 minutes. So this is why a lot of people eat bananas while they ride, right? Cause they're like, oh, it's instant sugar. I feel good. It's easy on the stomach but it only lasts for about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes if you're lucky, because your blood sugar goes down again. Why? Because it, a banana is only carbohydrate based. It does not have protein or fat. So what we know in, in science biochemistry 101 is if you combine a protein, which usually has fat with it, right? Usually, if you combine a protein with a carbohydrate, it will actually lower the blood sugar response. So now you have a happy blood sugar line, which you can see as the red dotted line. So why is this so important to put together a carbohydrate with a protein and the protein does have some fat associated with it? Why is that so important? Well, here's the thing. Whenever you have a blood sugar spike that increases your hunger because you feel like you need to eat every 60 or 90 minutes, it also decreases your satiety we are factoring in the weight loss goal, right? That is not a good thing with weight loss. You actually want to be more satiated. You want to be satiated for about three or four, maybe five hours in between the times that you eat, right? It also, having the, the, the unhappy blood sugar line where you're just seeing it spike and then drop, that actually teaches your body to burn carbohydrates and store fat. Now, if you remember what I just said, especially for weight loss, 
you want the exact opposite, right? You want to teach your body to burn fat and store carbohydrates, not the other way around. So, it, and it's all coming down to this, this biochemical reaction in your body that actually with, with a spike in blood sugar, there's actually a rush of insulin that comes in. Insulin, one of the, the jobs of insulin is to lower your blood sugar. Another job is to actually significantly reduce the body's ability to burn fat. <gasps> And this isn't me making it up. It's biochemistry 101. Look in any biochemistry book. So this is interesting, right? So if we look at this and we think, wait a second, if he's telling me that if I want to lose weight or change my body composition, I need to control blood sugar. So I have to stop eating my banana by itself. I need to put some nut butter with it. Like that would be fantastic because nut butter has a little bit of carbohydrate, has good protein, and it has good fat, right? So that together will lessen the blood sugar spike it will lessen the insulin surge, which will keep your body teaching itself how to burn fat as energy, leading to more weight loss and body composition changes, rather than increasing carbohydrate burn, which you don't need right now during the cycle. You don't need to be a good carbohydrate burner, especially if you wanna lose weight. Now, I did wanna put in here because this is more of a health thing, and as we all are, of course, aging, we do need to factor this in. If you if your blood sugar spikes uh, all throughout the day, and that's just the way you eat, there is uh, there is actually risk fat risk for developing certain disease states. One of them is insulin resistance. So if your body becomes insulin resistant, you can actually develop diabetes, right? So we don't want to consistently work in this roller coaster blood sugar. We want to keep it nice and steady. And there's going to be times where it spikes. We we understand that absolutely, but majority of the time, ninety percent of the time. We want to try to control blood sugar by putting together carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So let me, let me talk to you about, we're going to launch into daily nutrition. So get your pens and pencils fired up here. I firmly believe that simple is sustainable. And this is going to knock your socks off when you, when you read this uh, and when you hear me talk about this. So we do want to combine aerobic exercise and nutrition, but we know when it comes to weight loss through various studies and, and research that if you just do good nutrition, you will lose weight and change your body composition. But here's the thing, you're athletes, like you, you have to combine a blood. It just makes sense, right? It just makes sense to combine exercise and weight and nutrition. So let me teach you how to do it. You may have remembered this from last time. This is called my fuel target. This is basically a really fancy way of saying, I want you to combine protein, fiber, and fat. Right. So let me look at, let me just un, like, explain this to you. So this looks like a dartboard, right? Most of us grew up with darts. You put a dart in my hand. What's the first thing I want to do? I want to hit the bullseye, which is number one. There's a psychological inference here of the reason why I developed this model. I want to hit number one because number one is protein slash fat. Now, remember what I said about blood sugars a couple slides ago? We want protein and fat to be in the mix with carbohydrates. So we lower your blood sugar response so we can teach the body to burn more fat. So if we identify this, and this, this sounds silly to a lot of athletes, but basically this is what I'm asking you to do. When you eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and most snacks, I want you to think about one thing first. I want you to think, where is my protein? Why do I say that? Because as endurance athletes, we usually forget about protein, right? Carbo we are carbohydrate just freaks sometimes, right? And carbohydrates are so readily available in our country. We're never going to go shy and, and, and go a little bit lower on the carbohydrate. Like they're always there, right? But endurance athletes usually decrease their protein just because they either forget about it, they can't find it, or it's just not important. So I like to change the paradigm of the way you think and say, identify your protein source first, then you won't forget about it. And here's another bonus. We know that protein actually manipulates blood sugar in the most positive way by itself. So you could literally eat a piece of cheese or a piece of meat or deli meat or whatever, and you don't see much of a spike in blood sugar. It's a very easy control line. Whereas if you put some carbohydrates with it, you have to counterbalance the carbs with the protein and the fat, right? So protein is a powerful, powerful nutrient for many different reasons, right? The second rung are your fruits and veggies, right? That's your fiber. We know fiber actually helps keeps us satiated. There's a ton of health benefits also keeping the digestive system clear and, and really functioning well, but there's a ton of research supporting fiber with protein will actually keep you satiated longer. 
Now let's just think back to weight loss. What do we want to do? We don't want to be eating every 60 minutes, right? 90 minutes. We want to feel satiated. We want to feel like we're not eliminating foods. We don't want to want, we don't want to eat like a rabbit or like a little bird, like a little picking here and there. Like we still want to be really, really uh, involved with the food that you eat and not have to eliminate or sacrifice. So by following the fuel target, identifying protein and fat first, then fiber from fruits and vegetables, although I am going to talk about that here in a second, and then whole grains. If you need whole grains, that's a big if, and, and just wait for the next couple of slides, big if there. That's the way I want you to start building your meals and building your snacks. So we want to eat from the inside out instead of the outside in. If you eat from the inside out, you actually control your blood sugar much better. Thus, you're able to mobilize more fat as energy. Thus, you're able to burn more fat which means you're going to lose weight and body composition changes. Now, I should, I should make note on this. Some of the athletes I work with, depending on their body size, they don't see a lot of weight loss, but they see a lot of body composition changes. So I do want you to keep that in mind that sometimes, and that's why I opened with, I'm not the biggest fan of the whole scale thing, right? But a lot of times my athletes see these tremendous fat to muscle redistribution, but their weight is probably within about five pounds of where they started, but they're happy because they're like, hey, most, most of the time, right? They say, I don't really care about the number. I just care about what I'm holding and where I'm holding it, right? In terms of fat mass versus, versus lean mass. Now, I, before we leave this slide, because we're just coming off the holidays, I think it's really important to just bring up the misses once again. And that's the 10%. Those are the circles outside of your target. Misses such as, you know, cakes and cookies and probably things we had over the holiday season, right? I don't want you to think of those as bad, right? That's the, that's kind of the psychology of this. Those are part of your lifestyle, right? We just want to minimize the misses. So it could be cakes and cookies and sweets and desserts. It could also be things like alcoholic beverages, wine and beer and hard alcohol, whatever it is, right? Those things that you can't really identify as protein or fat or really carbohydrates and try not to make the argument of alcohol and carbohydrates because it's, it's debunked, right? Um, but a lot of athletes still try to do that with myself. But I do want you to associate that and say, it's okay, like 10% of the time to have your misses because that creates a healthy relationship with food, okay? All right, let's launch in here really quick. This is, I think I showed this last time. This is actually your food list. So you can take this, jot down a piece of paper, write down what foods you enjoy, what foods you don't enjoy. Basically just make a list of what you enjoy. This becomes your shopping list. This also becomes your meal planning list because literally you just need to pick one food from the protein and fat column, one from the fruit and veggie, maybe one from the whole grains. And if you're having a miss that day, have the miss that day. Like literally that's how easy it is. But here's the thing. If you're trying to engage in weight loss or body composition, this isn't your food list. No, 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 no. This is the eat to train food list. This is the, I'm pretty comfortable with my body right now. I don't really have a lot of weight or body composition changes. Use this list. Absolutely. But if you're trying to engage in weight loss or body composition changes, this becomes your list. So you see a couple changes, a couple switcheroos, right? Nothing really fancy about this. This is actually how I counsel athletes and how I take them through the, the weeks and weeks and weeks when I work with them. So if you're specifically looking for weight loss, body composition changes, you, the highest priority when you choose foods are protein and fat, which I, I think I've, I've really explained quite a bit about, and vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. Okay, why? Vegetables and fruit, very similar in nutrients in terms of micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, fiber, phenomenal, right? Where they differ is in the caloric value. So if you take like a, like a serving of spinach versus an orange, right? They have a lot of the same minerals, micro, micronutrients, but when we're talking about the caloric value, that, hand, that, that serving of spinach has a lot fewer calories than does an orange. Usually vegetables, depending on the vegetable, and this is why I emphasize non-starchy. So basically you wanna take out the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the peas and the corn, carrots, those kind of things, right? Those are a little bit lower on the priority list with vegetables. But that said, usually a serving of vegetable has a third of the calories, if not more than a serving of fruit. If you're in the weight loss phase, I'm not gonna say that calories are, you know, calorie is a calorie is a calorie, because it's not. 
But at the end of the day, don't count calories, but we do have to be conscious of what foods are contributing calories to our body. And if we want weight loss, your go-to, your 90% is protein and fat and vegetables. Lower priority, but you can still have them, right? That's the beauty of this. You're not eliminating, you're not, you're not sacrificing. You can still have fruit. You can still have whole grains and misses, but those become very, very low priority during your weight loss phase. I usually give this about eight to 12 weeks of successful behavior change for weight loss. <clears throat> Can it happen earlier, sooner than that? Yes, but most of the time, I think I said this earlier, if you, if you stand on the scale and you see a shift of about four to five pounds, that's just water weight, right? So usually you see about a shift of four or five pounds depending on what you're eating in about two to four weeks. So it's, it's great progress. You're like, okay, it's working, but that's not fat weight yet. It usually have to pass that four or six week barrier to really look at fat loss versus just water loss. So if you're in, in, if you're, let me just review, if you're eating to train and you have no weight loss goals, this is your food list that I want you to focus on. If the opposite is true, I just need you to redistribute your priorities in terms of your foods. And I need you to really focus on protein, fat, and vegetables, specifically non-starchy vegetables. Now, how do we do it? Well, I showed you this last time too, but I did, I wanted to get, I totally got excited about this because I, I can actually talk more about this. This is my hand model. And a lot of you remember this, right? Because a lot of people say, well, if I'm not counting calories, how do I know how much to eat? Well, I've done my research, ton of research in weight loss, satiety, diabetes, everything. And suffice to say, the hand from the wrist to the fingertips, the entire hand, not the fingertips, not a finger, a thumb or a palm, no, no, no. Your entire hand in terms of protein is pretty conducive to the, your, your, your needs for that meal or that snack. I'll talk about snacks here in a second, but if that makes sense, like smaller petite females usually have smaller hands, larger males usually have bigger hands. It usually works out that that's about the same or the, the amount of protein that your body needs regardless of your size. So it works out beautifully unless you just have like freakishly huge hands or small hands, right? That said, this is a qualitative model, one that I love to teach because I really do not like athletes counting calories because I did say it before, a calorie is not a calorie. In fact, the FDA actually allows food manufacturers up to 25% error in their calorie reporting. So even if you say, oh yeah, there's a serving of this is hundred calories, that could be 75 to 125 calories. And if you've ever logged like in my fitness pal or anything, it, you know how difficult it is sometimes to actually find foods that you eat or make your own food. So that's why I'm really, I don't really get in the business of counting calories and having athletes count calories. So I work to my hand model. So here's the thing we can pretty much throw away the three to one, the four to one, right? The hands indicate carbohydrate and protein. So one hand is carbohydrate. So let's say, let's say, let's say you had chicken and broccoli tonight. It's just really easy, right? You would have as much broccoli as you could grab in your hand, salad, right? Every, anything you can grab me all carbohydrate. The chicken needs to be at least the size of your hand. That's carbohydrate to protein. That's the ratio or the hand model. Why is that so important? Because this is actually scientifically validated in terms of how it optimizes your blood sugar. And that's where we get into this one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one. So what we know is a one to one, one hand of carbs to one hand of protein, that together is ideal, optimal for blood sugar control. What do we know about blood sugar control? it improves your body's ability to burn fat. That's where we wanna be, especially for weight loss in the base training mode, right? Two to one, so two hands of carbs to one hand of protein, still okay, it's still pretty good, but not for weight loss, right? Just That's just if you're eating to train right now in the prep cycle. And you can see on, on below uh, that last column or that last row, actually specify which training cycle you should associate this one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one, right? Right now, please don't follow three to one or four to one. It is not the training cycle to do that right now. So don't even worry about that. If you are focused on weight loss, which I'm gonna talk about in, in detail right now, we're gonna focus on that one to one or possibly less than one to one. And that would be a little bit of restricting your carbohydrates. I don't do that often, but I will tell you that it is safe to do. However, 
extremely difficult to do. So that's why I usually don't recommend it because it is so difficult for most people to, and I'm not talking about ketogenic, like, like severely restrict your carbohydrates. I'm just talking about going like a half a handful of carb to a handful of protein. That's hard. That's much more difficult than you think it is. So I'm not telling you not to try it. I'm just telling you after, you know, counseling thousands of athletes doing this, that's, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult. So I like to start at the one-to-one because it's safe, right? We know most people can do it and then you can kind of progress, but we really want to focus on the one-to-one for weight loss. If you're eating to train two to one is absolutely fine. Two to one is fine. If you're just eating to train, just focusing on prep phase base training, because because that two to one will still teach your body to burn fat, right? So you see the green, the ideal and the good. As long as you stay between that one to one to two to one, you're perfect, right? It's golden. But if you want the weight loss, we have to tilt the scale more than or more towards the one to one. So let me show you, and this is this comes up quite a bit. Actually, let me go back one. If you're saying, if I should, you know, you're basically because athletes ask me this all the time, what should I follow? Should I do a one to one? Should I do a two to one? A lot of it depends, number one, on how many carbohydrates you're consuming right now. So if you're consuming a lot of carbohydrates, please don't go down to one to one tomorrow. It is going to be so ridiculously harsh on your body and your brain. I like a stepwise approach or what I call carbohydrate unloading, right? So if you're coming off the holidays, and you're like, yeah, my meals are usually, you know, oatmeal with, you know, water and, and, maybe some raisins or banana. And, you know, for lunch, I, I have a sandwich, but I hardly have any meat or cheese on it. Like if you're really eating a lot more carbs right now, don't launch into one-to-one, maybe start at two to one, see how your body responds. Cause here's the thing. Here's a golden nugget. Your body will freak out the first three to five days upon any change of your nutrition program. Remember that the first three to five days is the freak out process, right? Expect it. It could take longer. Uh, it, sometimes it actually does. goes up to maybe seven to 10 days for some people, but expect that's going to happen. It's not like the keto flu or a keto rash or anything like that. It's just, if you think about it, if you're eating you know, four, uh, three to one, so three handfuls of carbohydrate to one handful of protein at every meal, and now you're going to go down to two, well, of course your body is going to respond to that. It has to respond to that, but it takes about three to five days partly because of digestion and partly because of the effects on the brain. So the cognitive functioning. So what we know is when we stabilize blood sugar better, you have improved cognitive functioning, right? Okay. So that said, that's one, one key thing to remember. The other key thing to remember is in terms of, uh, of testing, but more importantly, where you start, it kind of depends on how efficient or inefficient your body is. So let me just, let me throw this out. Let's just take a, a quick deep breath here. I'm going to take a, a sip of water real quick. This is going to require a little bit of brain work here. All right. This is what I'm showing. What I'm showing you is actually, I, I showed you some examples last webinar too. This is of a gal, early thirties, fitness enthusiast. She's not highly, highly competitive, but she's, you know, she definitely knows her stuff. Like she, as you can see, this is a female power output of 160 and 210. Like you're like, oh yeah, that, okay. She, she does her, she does train. I want to show you this because depending on where your body switches. So see that star on both those graphs, that's the switch. That's where your body says, I need more carbohydrates and less fat because the intensity of exercise is increasing. And I didn't put that scale on here. I just screenshotted these, these really quickly. But from left to right, we're seeing an increase in watts. And I can't remember where she started with, with, with her. I think we started like at 100 watts. Every data point is a four minute stage of increased power. So 100, I think with her, we went 100 to 120, 130. 40, 160. Yep. That was exactly what I did. 180, 210 to 180, 200 to 20. Right. So it's progressively getting lower to higher intensity as we go left to right. The black line is the carbohydrate burning line or carbohydrate oxidation line. The red line is the fat burning line. This is hopefully you're going to, you're going to follow this really quickly on her first test, which is the top graph. Her, her, basically her crossover, her metabolic efficiency point, I call it, the point at which her body needs more carbs and doesn't start burning a lot of fat anymore, was at 133 beats per minute and 160 watts. 
we made some nutrition implementation strategies. We really changed some things around. She did want a little bit of, she didn't want weight loss, but she wanted body composition change. She wanted to lose fat, right? Two months later, we retested her. And that's what the graph you see on the bottom. So two months later, she actually improved her body's efficiency in burning fat because she was able to burn fat all the way up to 164 beats per minute and a power output of 210 watts. Why is that important? Like a lot of you are like, well, yeah, that's cool. She, she did great. Why is that important? Well, this is what I have athletes say all the time. If, if I'm starting in, in you know, base training, and I want to lose weight or change body composition, whatever it is regarding manipulating the, the way the body looks or feels, right? Where should I train? Because nutritionally, we've got it down, right? You stabilize blood sugar, you combine protein and fiber and fat, you try to not go on the roller coaster blood sugar, but try to keep it stable, right? We've got that part. But where do you go with exercise? What zone do you train in? So a lot of athletes said, oh, if I just stay in zone two, when they tell me that though, I don't know where their zone two is. So let's look at this athlete once again. What if her zone two was at 133 beats per minute and that's where she actually switched into zone three? I don't know that because she, you know, we didn't do a lactate threshold test on her, no FTP testing, but this is just metabolic data, right? So my point is this. What if her zone three started at 133 beats per minute? Then if she trained in zone two or below, she would actually, which is to the left of the star, she would be burning more fat and that would work great. But what if she was the athlete that she tested at two months later? What if she was that athlete and came in and said, oh, I know my zone three is at 133 beats per minute and above. And I said, oh, okay, well then we want to be below zone three because that's aerobic aerobic exercise improves the body's ability to burn fat on the mitochondrial level through, beta, through enhanced beta oxidation, right? So if she came in and said, 133 is my break point, it's my zone two to zone three. And I said, oh, well, you want to be in zone one, zone two training to burn more fat, right? That's the 25% of this whole equation here. She would actually be shorting herself, right? Because she can burn fat up to 164 beats per minute or 210 watts. So what I'm saying is, this is why I said in the early, early beginning, if you ever have an opportunity to, to do a metabolic efficiency test, please do. You can't estimate this, unfortunately, because I can change your metabolic efficiency in about seven days, maybe even less than that, just through nutrition changes. That's why you can't really accurately measure this without having someone measure it, right? So if you ever have the opportunity, it doesn't mean you can't be successful in weight loss and body composition without testing, because I've taken hundreds of athletes through weight loss and body composition changes without testing. You can still do it. It just takes a little bit longer because as, as I know Shane would agree, when you have data, you can actually use that data to make significant improvements and the learning curve gets a lot shorter. So I just wanted to throw that. I hope I explained that uh, appropriately to, to kind of validate why the testing, because the testing will actually help with the exercise prescription zone training part of your weight loss journey. Now, here's where it really gets good. And I know there's a lot of stuff on here. I do apologize. This is where I got totally excited. This is where I'm talking about my microcycle periodizations. So remember earlier, I said I was going to break down the week, Monday through Sunday. My brain works in Monday through Sunday, right? So on the top, we have Monday through Sunday. The second, the blue row indicates the training. And I just, I just threw stuff together just so I could talk about it, right? This is nobody's training program, but a typical, I would say like a typical uh, base training for a, for, an, for a recreational to, to age group cyclist, right? So we've got the training in blue, we've got weight loss goals in green, and we've got no weight loss goal. Remember, that's just the eating to train, right? So let me just go through this really quick, because this is exactly what I do with athletes when I work with them one-on-one. -on -one. We have to, like, I always ask, what is your training cycle? Check. We know it. It's base training. It's prep cycle. Number two is tell me about your week. Break down your week. This is where it gets good. So as an example, I chose this athlete. So Monday, he or she is going to do a one hour zone two ride. Tuesday, strength. Wednesday, this is their one little oomph during the week. That's an hour ride. It's threshold, maybe some VO2 short intervals, right? Just to kind of keep the legs uh, and the heart rate up. Thursday could be a one and a half hour zone two, maybe three ride, maybe dipping into that tempo. Friday is strength. 
And then Saturday, Sunday, you get your longer, kind of your long, long slow distance, your zone two rides, like tr very traditional for most of us in base training. So, and you can put, and this is what's important, you, I want you to actually put your training in that block. So talk to Shane about this because here's where it really gets good. If you have a weight loss goal, the beautiful thing here is we periodize based on the hand model, right? So let's look at the green row really quick. Remember the one-to-one, -one, right? One hand carb to one hand protein. On Monday, and I always associate nutrition to support training, but if you come to me and say, Bob, my main goal is weight loss or body composition changes, and, and I'm going to tell you that I'm gonna be in mostly zone two training, I'm gonna give you the thumbs up and I'm gonna develop your plan based on that, right? Here's what we're gonna say. Monday is a one-to-one -one eating day. Tuesday, why? So, so B, K, L, U, and D, N, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Okay, that's my, my, so my legend there. Why do I break those up on Tuesday and Wednesday? Well, here's the thing. If you tell me, Bob, I don't wanna tank that one hour ride. And I know it's not hard, but here's the thing. If you are eating one-to-one, -one, this, this should be common knowledge, but you will not have as many carbohydrates in your body ready to use for high intensity exercise. Now for an hour ride, even with some threshold or VO2 sprints in there, you would be totally fine, right? Absolutely fine. But it's, 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 it's to, to know this is very important, right? You will deplete your body's carbohydrate stores when you follow a one-to-one. -one. That's why I'm not a big fan of doing one-to-one -one anytime uh, during your, your pre-competition or competition cycle, because you're not going to get enough carbs in your body. But now with weight loss, perfect, right? So here's the reason why I periodize on Tuesday and Wednesday, because if you come up to me and say, Bob, you know, I really don't want to tank this one hour ride. It's not super important, but you know, coach wants me to really hit my power numbers, my heart rate. Like I, I really want to do well with this. Then I protect that one quality training session, quality meaning in this example, high intensity, right? Or higher than zone two. Because remember what we, we, we delineated earlier is aerobic exercise in zone one or zone two can help the body burn fat. Anything above, most of the time, your body will start burning more carbohydrates. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to play with the body's ability to store carbohydrates. So here's a huge take home message. It takes about 16 to 24 hours to fill up your carbohydrate tanks. They're called glycogen, stored carbohydrates called glycogen. 16 to 24 hours to fill up your tanks. I'm, I'm guessing with the training, and, and I put this up here, I'm just assuming in this situation or probably with most of you that you're doing morning training, right? So, so it does, you, you can back up uh, the, the meals and what, when you're going to have one to one or two to one and three to one possibly. But in this situation, the athlete is exercising or training in the morning. On Wednesday, they're doing an hour kind of threshold VO2 ride. Tuesday breakfast is, is a one to one. Tuesday lunch is a one-to-one. -one. Remember, that's weight loss goal, weight loss body composition. But when we get into dinner, we can actually not load, but we can increase carbohydrate availability, which means you just eat more carbs, right? That two-handed carbs to one, because I guess it does depend on what time you eat dinner to what time you're training in the morning. That should be about 16 hours or so, right? That will give your body enough time to store a little bit more carbohydrate so you're not completely tanking on that one hour threshold VO2 ride. So you have a little bit of gas left in the tank to actually do that, that training session. That's why I, I periodize it that way, right? And this is how specific I get with people who want to lose weight. Now, after that session on Wednesday's breakfast, again, I'm, it's the assumption that you're, you're doing this in the morning. Maybe you have a little bit of snack before the ride, which you should do, right? Even if you're doing a weight loss phase, you should not do a hard training session fasted, especially if you're a female. Do not do that. Not a good thing, right? After your training session on Wednesday, you can do one of two things. You could have a breakfast that is more of like a one-to-one. -one. That could be like scrambled eggs and some spinach, onions, tomatoes, that kind of a thing together. Um, or you could do a two-to-one, but you don't have to do a two-to-one unless you're still coming down on your carbohydrate unloading. So what I'm saying is most of the time in a weight loss phase in base training, this one-to-one -one eating will not steer you wrong. It's hard, remember, it's, it's difficult, but it will not steer you wrong because it's gonna optimize your blood sugar, turn on fat burning, and everything is, is good. 
but there are going to be times where you have to kind of go up and down or mostly up in carbohydrate to supply your body with more carbohydrate to satisfy one or two training sessions during the week. We know that's going to happen, right? So this was my example. And then you can see the rest of the week, all one-to-one. -one. Now, if you're not in a weight loss phase, if you're just in the eating to train, that's the yellow row right beneath it. You can see it's mostly following a two to one. And there is a little bit of a bump up in carbohydrate on that, that Tuesday dinner, just like we did with the weight loss, but it's everything is a little bit higher with carbohydrate because there's not a weight loss goal per, uh, pertaining uh, to your, to your uh, situation and your schedule, right? So I hope that makes sense. So and, and the reason why I put this in, because usually you don't eat the same thing every single day. Well, some people do, but you don't eat the same way every single day, right? You're going to fluctuate. Maybe one meal is a two to one. And the next one is a one to one. Maybe it's a half to one. Like it's all going to balance out. But if you want to really focus on weight loss and body composition, we have to stay in the confines of closer to one to one. And if you're just trying to eat to train during base season, Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks can be more closer to two to one, right? Those are the kind of the guidelines there. That's daily nutrition, daily nutrition. What happens when you say, well, I'm going to do a two hour ride on Saturday and maybe a three hour ride on Sunday, but it's low intensity. It's zone one, zone two ish, right? With the, with the group or maybe on your own and maybe Zwift, whatever it is, right? This is the nutrient timing, I guess, table, if you will for the prep phase. And this, this actually changes based on what training cycle you're in. So we have to keep in mind two things. Are you eating to train or are you trying to lose weight and change body composition? So let me go through this really quick. You see four different columns. On the left, we have the nutrients. The nutrients that are usually important before, during, and after a, a session, a training session, are fluid, carbs, protein, fat, and sodium, uh, electrolytes, but sodium in particular, right? We have before training, which usually we're thinking, what do we put in our body one to three hours before? It could be 30 minutes even, sometimes depending on the digestibility. During the ride, what am I putting in my body? And then immediately after, I'm talking first like minute off the bike and really up to 15 minutes because I like to be kind of aggressive with the recovery and nutrition. But that said, from a hydration standpoint, Really, this is the time of the year, and it depends on where you live. If it's colder and you don't, you know, you're probably sweating a lot if you're doing indoor training, uh, but you need to stay on top of your hydration. But that's going to change, right? Your sweat rate, the rate at which your body sweats out fluid, will change from this stage to the really, it, it's really dependent on the season, right? Winter, spring, summer, and fall, right? Your sweat rate will change. So you kind of have to stay on top of that, right? There is a little bit, like you can get quantitative if you want. Normally, I just recommend an athlete try to go through a typical bike bottle of, of fluid about an hour before their, their session. That usually gives them enough time to at least catch up on some hydration. But what I'm saying right now is hydration shouldn't be your most focal uh, point when it comes to nutrient timing. It's very important for daily nutrition when you wanna lose weight. Absolutely, we know this. But right now, just focus on like, like, I would say the norm for hydration, like drink a bottle an hour. That's usually a safe thing. Drink a bottle. If you have a high sweat rate, maybe a bottle and a half or two bottles an hour, especially if you're indoors, right? Afterwards, we know we need fluid. It just depends on how much you need based on how much you've lost in fluid. So you can do the whole, you know, weigh yourself naked before a training session and after, and you can kind of figure out how much you need to drink. Honestly, I just tell my athletes, drink another bike bottle, not necessarily of just water. You actually want a little bit of sodium in there because that's when the body will absorb it more, right? So fluid aside, we really need to spend some time on talking about the things that supply calories, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Here's the thing. Before any training session during the base training phase, I don't care if your goal is weight loss or not, you're trying to make yourself more efficient at using your fat stores, right? This is the time of the year to try to do that, right? It's very easy to teach your body how to use carbohydrate stores. Like it literally takes a couple of days and it's good to go, but it takes a lot longer to teach it to learn to use fat as energy. When it comes to before a training session, you should feed your body, right? It doesn't have to be a lot but it should be a balance. This is what's gonna differ between now and like the competitive cycle, right? Now we actually need a little bit of balance of carbs, protein, and fat. So maybe it's not just the waffle. Maybe it's not just the high carbohydrate bar or sport drink beforehand. Save that for competition season, right? When your body really needs those carbohydrates. Now we need to optimize blood sugar before a training session. Listen to this very clear, carefully. 
if you do like a sport drink or a waffle or whatever that's purely carbohydrate, if you consume that before a training session, you are accelerating your body's uh, burning or oxidation of carbohydrate. So you're actually going in a carbohydrate burning mode very, very quickly. Remember what I said way back when? Everybody has a very limited stores of carbohydrate. So what that means is if you actually have a lot of carbohydrates before a training session, during the base training phase, keep that in mind, preparatory training phase, you're going to need carbohydrates during that one hour ride because you're, you're already accelerating their usage. But we don't want that during base training. What you want to do is keep your carbohydrate burning lower so we can turn up the fat burning during that ride. So the optimal situation is to, I mean, honestly, I have a lot of athletes, their go-to is like half a banana and a spoonful of peanut butter or just a couple of spoonfuls of peanut butter or nut butter, right? Whatever you want. That will stabilize your blood sugar, which means it's keeping your carbohydrate burning a little bit less and your fat burning a little bit more. Combine that with your zone one, zone two training, it's a great marriage, right? Absolutely hands down. So that's why a lot of this, what you see on here, it's duration dependent, it's intensity dependent, but it's also, are, is your goal weight loss and body composition or is it eating to train, right? So on your two hour ride, cause I know someone will have this question, two to three hour long ride on the weekend. If you're trying to lose weight, here's what I would say, right? If it is purely zone one and zone two, you're not gonna be breaching that and going a little bit higher have a great breakfast beforehand. Maybe have some eggs, have, have a little, some veggies, maybe a serving of fruit, right? So have a little bit, maybe like you're one-to-one, -one, right? During the ride, have an emergency snack just in case, put it in your pocket, just in case. Don't use it unless you really need it because here's the thing I haven't told you. You have enough carbohydrates in your body to go at least two to three hours of moderate intensity training. Hmm. Do the math. If you're two hours or below, you should be totally fine on not consuming calories during this phase only if you eat a well-balanced, metabolically efficient meal beforehand. Now, if you're going to just go into it and you don't eat breakfast, you better have something on that ride. I mean, you're going to need something. Like, I am not a huge fan of fasted training for many, many, many reasons. We could talk about that a little bit later. But if, if that makes sense, like that, that two hour mark is okay. Once you get to two, two and a half to three, then, then it gets my attention. I'm like, oh, you're probably going to need to eat something, right? You can eat anything during a ride because here's what a lot of people don't understand. During exercise, the insulin response is actually blunted. So you could have a, like a gel, like a carbohydrate gel. It's not going to spike your insulin and your blood sugar because insulin is suppressed during exercise. So you have what you need during your ride. But what I'm saying is use your body's metabolic ability and the zone one, zone two training to improve the efficiency. And, but here's the thing too. You have to carry emergency calories with you because if you're trying to come down from like a higher carb nutrition plan and you're trying to get to like the two to one or even the one to one, it's going to take time, right? So have your emergency ration just in case you may need it in an hour, hour and a half, right? It absolutely may need to be done. Um, in terms of recovery, let me talk about that real quick. <clears throat> After you get off the bike, depending on, of course, the duration intensity, you can either facilitate a greater amount of fat being burned, or you can shut off your fat burning response. And, and this is why when athletes say, well, what should I have after a ride? The first thing I ask is, well, what training cycle are you in? The second thing I ask is, do you have weight loss or body composition goals, right? Because those two together is really what we're trying to get to the bottom of. So if we're in base training, we are prep training, right? And if you have a weight loss goal, the last thing you want to do after a ride is turn off your body's ability to burn fat. Because here's the thing, during zone two or less training, you're actually improving your body's ability to burn fat. So why would you want to turn it off after training? doesn't make sense. That means this, don't slam a high carbohydrate drink or bar or gel right after you get off the bike. Have something that ha still has carbohydrate, but has a little bit of protein and has a little bit of fat because that will stabilize your blood sugar and keep your fat burning response going. If you're simply eating to train, and you don't care about weight loss, then yeah, you need to get about a two to one. So two part carbohydrate to one part protein in right after you get off the bike. Why not three to one? Why not four to one? Like we've always heard, 
because this is the prep cycle. This is base training and you simply do not need all of that, right? Not in this cycle, not yet. That time, your time will be coming, right? So I hope that, I, I know there's a lot of information there. I hope that kind of clears it up a little bit and kind of gives you a little bit of a roadmap here. I just really want to summarize this. Like I said earlier, I, I'm super excited to combine these uh, when Shane and I were, were discussing this because base training and weight loss or body composition changes do go hand in hand, but you do need to really commit if you are trying to lose weight or change body fat or body composition, you need to commit to that as your primary goal and communicate with your coach, with Shane and say, this is my primary goal. Let's make sure my training kind of supports that instead of hampering that. Cause I see, unfortunately, I see a lot of athletes trying to do the wrong things during base training. Usually they're not guided by coaches because they're doing all these intervals and all this crazy stuff. I'm like, listen, that's fine if you don't want to try and lose, if you're not trying to lose weight, but if you're trying to lose weight, you really need to respect that and give yourself, you know, probably two or three months of that still getting fit. Don't get me wrong. Right. But really, really supporting your body's ability to, to lose weight and change its body composition. Whew. Okay. Here are a few resources. Uh, you can get a hold of me, obviously, through energyperformance.com. And Shane has my, my info. I'll leave my email address here. But um, I do have a, a few, a few uh, uh, recipe books, number one, which I'll show you in a second. But also, I just created my gourmet snacks, snack food line. Um, it's actually two, I have two flavors that actually optimize blood sugar really well. It has extra protein in it. Uh, you can read all about that. I also have a food company that actually uh, improves blood sugar through uh, uh, our products, cocoa, uh, creamer, and some anti-oatmeal. So with that, let's, uh, let's open it up, Shane, see if we have any questions. All right. So I just have a few in the chat, and then I guess others can hop in if they would like to. But um, yeah. first one I got was from Benji. So Benji uh, asks about body fat percentage measurements and scales, hmm. and are yes. they all accurate, or are they at all accurate, I should say? They are. Here, here's a great thing. Um, body composition scales, like the ones you either stand on or put your hands in, they send a little electrical current through. Those are good for trend analysis. They will never, well, in fact, nothing is 100% accurate in terms of body composition testing. Uh, DEXA, like I mentioned, is still within about 1%. So that's why it's the gold standard. Everything else, especially the scales, scales, you're probably in the probably 6 to 8% error range. But here's my thing. I like athletes tracking trends on those scales <clears throat> rather than a specific number. So if I step on it and says, oh, 20%, well, I'm probably not 20%, but I am gonna track the trend over the next couple of months. So maybe it goes from 20 to 18 to 16. That's what's important when you use the scales. They're not highly accurate in terms of the exact number though. Cool. And then uh, C. Todd, so he has a few questions. Uh, breakdown of protein, fruits, and vegetables, and whole grains. I think you covered that with your hand model. Mm -hmm. um, the target percentage in this bullseye. Mm -hmm. I think that was a hand model too, right? And then yep, yep, yep. Um, the uh, example of a filled out version of his fuel fuel target food list. So I guess do you have a oh, food right, list right. example? <laughs> yeah, I I don't I don't have it now, like to to show you, um, but but. I could, if, if you, um, I, don't, I didn't even put my email address, Shane, but you can share this or I can send it to you. You're I actually have the, a populated food list. I think list. you're on the emails. I think I sent, but if not, I'll send oh, an email yes. tomorrow once I pull this and I'll make okay. sure you're on there. Yeah. I do have a food list. Here's the reason I don't publish, publish that because I don't want, like, I don't want Shane saying, oh, well, I have to eat those foods because Bob put them on the list, right? I, I want you as athletes to create your own list, but, but I, I get you, like, you, you probably need the ideas, like, what goes on the protein yeah, example, and fat? What, what examples goes are really on? helpful. Exactly. Yeah. I can provide that. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And then, uh, Mike, so what's the easiest way to translate the one-to-one -one or two-to-one into actual food that I eat for the respect of the meal? And again, that's the hand model yes. again. Right. That's that. Yeah. And it's, and there's a, there's, it's a little bit of wiggle room. Right? I, I totally get it. Like if you do peanut butter, obviously you're not having a handful of peanut butter, right? So some things like peanut butter, yogurt, cottage cheese, those kind of things. Sometimes you have to go based on the serving size that states on the, on the actual package. But for the most part, if you're eating like mostly real food or like whole foods, 
you, you can't go wrong because it's, it's simply fitting the, the meats or the, the veggies or the fruits inside your hand. And don't actually scoop it up with your actual hands. Use a spoon when you do it. Correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially with peanut butter. <laughs> All right, the only other thing I had, which is more on my end, some athletes yeah. don't have 10, 12, 15 hours to train. So I may use a sweet spot based approach with them really early yep. in their base phase because they don't have time to train. What would yep. you recommend for those athletes that have to adopt a sweet spot, a sweet spot focus approach really early instead of a yeah. mostly zone two approach? I actually, for the, I don't want to say for majority, but I, I it's about a 60, 40 split. I've seen in, in my, in my practice, about 60% of athletes can actually do sweet spot training and still get away with this whole one-to-one, even two-to-one, um, and still make huge improvements. It's the 40%. And, and this is, this is a really good, um, to, to notice it's the 40% that have like ridiculously high carbohydrate intake to ridiculously low protein intake. Those are the ones that usually have the problems. And those are the ones that should actually probably stay more towards that three to one. Um, but, but here's the thing too, Shane, like you could take an athlete and say, okay, I want you to stay three to one during sweet spot training this week, next week, let's try two to one. Right. And then you can kind of get the body's ability to, to adapt over that sweet spot training, because it, it will know what to expect as you slowly drop down the carbs and increase that, that kind of the, the protein and the fat. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Bob? Give it a few seconds. Benji, hand raised. Yes, sir. You can unmute yeah, yourself. Yeah, I'd be yeah. curious to hear about fasted training. I've actually tried it a few times and um, it, it, very unscientifically, but seemed to have good results. But I'm just um, interested to hear what the issues are with that. Yep, that's a great, Benji. I'm actually great. Uh, glad you brought that up. So <clears throat> let me first qualify. Can I actually <clears throat> preface this one second? Oh, Benji yeah. is a different cat. He does uh, brevets. So he, he's done a parry breast parry a couple times. Mm -hmm. A couple times mm -hmm. or once? Can't remember. Twice. Twice, Twice. a couple times. So he's yeah. uh, kind of a freak athlete. <laughs> 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 it, so just to preface that, he's not your yeah. uh, everyday average Joe when it comes to that gotcha. kind of like endurance kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. So, so let me, let me preface this by saying it really depends on gender number one. So, and a lot of scientific research is actually starting to come out saying fasted training wreaks havoc on female hormones. So usually we don't do a lot of fasted training with females because it's disrupting hormone balance with males. I have seen it successful if the athlete can do one thing. And the one thing is actually stay in an aerobic zone unless they're crazy fat adapted, right? I've actually worked with a lot of ultra cyclists and ultra runners who are so fat adapted. They, they literally eat like once a day and they're totally fine, right? Cause they're so fat adapted, but they hardly eat any carbohydrates. So Benji, to your point, fasted training can absolutely work for males. If you respect that zone one, zone two training and stay there, because here's what we know about fasted training. You don't have a lot of glycogen stored in your muscles to support a lot of interval or high intensity, like threshold base. So I always tell athlete, male athletes, if you're going to do it, make sure the training session does not have long, inter, long, intense intervals, and then it should be okay. Yeah. The time, the times I've done it, I've done a really hard training at night after dinner. And yep. then in the morning you go out and do a long and slow for, you know, two exactly. Actually, the times I've done it, I've ridden for like three hours and I get a huge breakfast at a diner and then I go, yep. go ride out another five or six hours. And it's, it's just, yep. it, it was really fun. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, that, that all makes sense. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. A couple of seconds, see if anybody else has any questions and then we'll sign off. Nobody. Cool. Bob, my friend, thank you as always. You're oh, awesome. It's my pleasure. Everybody else. It's thank fantastic. you. I know we're a little bit over, so I appreciate your time. I will upload this to the site tomorrow and then shoot to everybody an email if they want to uh, refer back to it in the future and then have a good rest of the night. Awesome. Thanks everybody. All right. Bye, Bob. Thanks, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.